preachers I know. I saw this brother preach, I think he was 17, 16 maybe, the first time, 16 years old. For the first time I saw him preach before he really knew the truth. He could have sworn that he knew the truth. He was arguing with my friend John. John was like, no, you ain't got it yet, brother, but you're going to get it. And amen. And since that time, that brother went to Bible college, and I've just seen him blossom. He's a true evangelist from the Lord. I know that the Lord's given him a word. I know you're going to be blessed with the word of God this morning. Amen. Have your liberty, brother. Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house Hallelujah. of the Lord this morning. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And, um, just thankful for the presence of the Lord this morning. I'm so thankful that God still inhabits the praises of His people. Amen. Amen. And uh, that really means that God comes and He makes us His assembly. He comes yes. and He makes us His dwelling place whenever we choose in faith just to respond to who He is and to praise Him like we did this morning. Like so many of you uh, were engaged in praise and in worship this morning. And God came and He began to minister to us. He began to help us. He began to encourage us and, and stir us in ways that we cannot do for ourselves. Amen? Amen. And uh, that's what God does when His presence comes. We are nothing and we can do nothing outside of the presence of God. The presence of God is everything. We must have his presence. Yes. And He tells us in His Word that if we will just believe Him, if we'll praise Him, cry out to Him, that we can have Him 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Thank God for Sunday mornings when we can come together with the body of Christ and, and our brothers and sisters can encourage us through their praise and through their worship. But you don't have to wait until you get to church on That's Sunday right. morning right. to walk in fellowship, communion right. with the right. presence of God. Hallelujah. He is, He has made Himself available to you through the blood of His Son. Yes. And, and 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, you have access to the presence of God. Where you are, that's where God is. He's chosen to make His dwelling place in your heart and in your life. Yes. I just want to encourage you in that this morning, that God's with you. Amen? Amen. And His presence hasn't left you. You may be facing difficulty, trial, hardship, but God is with you as long as your faith is in Jesus this morning. Amen? Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. You know, I believe it's one of the greatest opportunities given to the minister of the gospel. I believe one of the greatest opportunities given to us as ministers of the gospel is the opportunity to remind the people of God of the promises of God that they have been given in Christ Amen. Jesus. Amen. Promises that are uh, can be appropriated by faith as they walk with God. Promises, blessings, strength. The presence, the help, the divine aid of God in every point and situation of life. I believe it's one of our responsibilities as ministers of the gospel to constantly put the people of God in remembrance of what God has provided for them in the Lord Jesus Christ. Promises that Paul would tell us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 are to you and I, yes. And amen. Yes. That, that God's hands are open. He, he didn't send Jesus to die on our behalf and uh, open up a way for us to receive all of these blessings to keep His hands closed. Do you understand this morning? His hands are open and, and there are so many blessings and provisions and promises in God today that you and I can appropriate if we will simply choose to walk with God in faith. These promises, they don't come to those who are, who are wise or who are strong or those who have it all together. No, they're made available to every single person who has said yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus is your Savior, He's your Lord, He's your Master, there are promises, there are provisions in God that are available for you today. And you need, we, we need to be reminded of those promises, of those provisions over and over and over again because so quickly and so easily we allow the cares of this life to come and to strip from us the knowledge that, that, that we have been given in Christ, the knowledge of these promises and these provisions. And so this morning, I really want to, you know, just as Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I just want to be a helper of your joy. I want to be one who comes alongside of you. I want to stir your faith. I want to uh, help your joy this morning in the Lord. Uh, maybe you're discouraged. Maybe you're downcast. Maybe you're traveling through a season uh, where you've become disheartened by the events, by the trials, by the happenings of life. It happens to every one of us. Amen. 
Uh, but the writer of Proverbs says, you know, there are times when our hearts do become weighty uh, by seasons of adversity, but that a good word, an in-season word will come and will help us. It will make us glad. It will give us the strength that we need to go another day and to go another moment. Amen. And so I want to draw your attention to Second uh, Timothy chapter 4. We're going to begin reading in verse 6. We're going to read quite a few verses to start uh, this morning. I, I really want to draw our attention to verses 16, 17, and 18. Um, but just for the sake of context, I'm going to read verses 6 through 18 as we begin this morning. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. This is the Apostle Paul writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. Uh, this was really the last words of the Apostle Paul, at least those that are penned in the Scriptures. And uh, Paul writes to his young son in the faith, Timothy, uh, concerning, really to encourage him, but also concerning his last thoughts uh, as, as, as he's about to depart this world. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all of them that love his appearing. Do your diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with you, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychus I have sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus. When you come, bring it with you in the books, and especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom you also beware, for he has greatly withstood our words. And this is really where I want to bring our attention, verses 16, 17, and 18, which really I believe give to you and I a summation uh, of the entirety of Paul's life, that this was the testimony, the story of the life of Paul. At my first answer, or at my first defense, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. But look at verse 17. Yes. But nevertheless, the Lord Amen. stood with me Amen. and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth yes. of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I want to minister a very simple message this morning, simply entitled, Preserved for a Purpose. Preserved for a Purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and we do so in the name of your Son, Jesus Father, we stand in great need of your help and of your grace today, of your anointing, God. Father, we are, in fact, very weak and frail vessels. But God, we know, Lord, according to the promises in your word, God, that you give us power, the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to yeah. properly and adequately convey the truths of your word to, Lord, bring a testimony of Jesus that would cause the world to be in amazement at His wonder, God. Father, we thank You for the power that You give us in Christ, Lord, to be Your servants, God. Father, You do not delight, Lord, in our strengths or in our natural abilities, Lord, but You actually delight in our weakness, Lord, because, Lord, it is in our weaknesses, God, that You can be made strong and that the testimony of Jesus can shine the brightest. And so, God, we just ask that you'd come and you'd help us today, Lord. Father, give each and every one of us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive what you're saying to us in this time and in this hour. And when it's all said and done as we do now, we'll be sure to give you the praise, 
the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Hallelujah. Through every generation, God has become famous. If you don't care for that term, He has become known by the saving and the delivering of His people from certain peril. For Noah, it was an ark that rescued him from a definite judgment that was to come. For Moses, it was a basket that rescued him from the hands of those who despised Jehovah God. For David, it was a stone that rescued he and his people from an ensuing giant that was attempting to devour the testimony of God among his people. And honestly, the list could go on and on and on. How that God through every generation has become known to the nations by the salvation and by the delivering of His people. Yeah. These, these few that we've talked about very briefly, they're just some of the familiar salvations of God. But ultimately, the testimony of those who have walked with, walked with God all throughout the centuries, it has always been that God has saved us from our enemies. We should have been overcome. We should have been overwhelmed. We should have been overthrown. But God right. delivered us. Right. Right. We were right. up against sure and definite peril. Right. But we experienced the salvation and the redemption of God. And the testimony is not only did God save me from that which should have destroyed me, but He even spared me from a downcast countenance. Yes. Meaning, I don't even look like what I had to go through because God not only spared me from what I went through, He spared my countenance and my life from being disheartened, discouraged, and downcast. What a testimony. The psalmist would say in Psalms chapter 42 and verse 11, he's experiencing a time of great discouragement, a time of great trial, and he begins to speak to himself and he says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? And then he speaks to himself and he says, Put your hope in God. Because God, he says in 42 and 11, God not only is my salvation, but God is also the salvation of my countenance. Yes. He saves my countenance from being despair, from being full of despair and discouragement and disheartening thoughts. He spares my countenance. Yes. This is the testimony of God, of the people of God through every generation. And God, time and time again, has gotten His glory out of these redemptions, yes. out of these rescues, out of these salvations. Thank you, Jesus. But understand, there is a vital ingredient to every one of these testimonies. And that vital ingredient or that reoccurring ingredient ingredient in every one of these testimony is trouble. That is a reoccurring ingredient. It's a vital ingredient to the glory of God being spread through the nation. It's trouble. Because in order for there to be deliverance, there must be something that I need to be delivered from. In order for there to be salvation, there has to be something that I need saving from. In order for there to be rescue, there has to be something that I am in need of being rescued from. Notice, it is never, the scriptures never imply that God spares us from trouble. But rather, that He saves us from the enemy's intent in our trouble. Thank you, Lord. It is never that God saves us or spares us from trouble. Jesus himself, John 16, tells us, in this world you shall have tribulation, but you can be of good cheer because I have already overcome the world. And so while God may not spare me from experiencing trouble, God's promise to me is this, that he will save me from the enemy intent in the midst of my trouble. Because every time 
trial and testing and trouble comes my way, the enemy wants to use it as a means of discouragement in my life in hopes that I'll give up and walk out on God. But God says, I'll let the trouble come, but I'm going to sustain you in the midst of your trouble so that you can be a testimony to the world and also to your enemy. Hallelujah. He prepares a table for us yes. in the presence Thank you, Lord. Yeah. of my enemies. Yeah. My enemies may be right there, but God promises that he will and has prepared a table for me, a table of provision, a table of blessings, yes. a table of great power in Christ Jesus. The enemies may still be there, but so is God. Yes. And if God is there, there is possibility and there is opportunity for me to experience victory regardless of the trouble, the accusation, the insult, the onslaught that comes against my life. Yes. I have become completely convinced that God allows trouble into our lives for the purpose of perfecting his testimony in us and through us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yes. And though contrary to human thought and estimation, perhaps the greatest trouble, the greatest testimony. Yes, sir. More trouble means more opportunity for Christ to be magnified in my life. Thank you, Lord. Because if he is glorified, if he is magnified in the salvation, in the freedom, in the deliverance yes. of yes. his people, yes. then when he allows me to endure these seasons of conflict and trial, he's allowing it to show somebody out there that he is able to deliver me. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, this does not mean that we should get to looking for trouble, right. right? It doesn't mean that we should uh, uh, go looking to get ourselves in all sorts of trouble. Amen. Amen. But it does mean that we should be assured, we should be convinced that when trouble comes, not if, but when trouble comes, it is not a sign of God giving up on me. Perhaps it is a sign that God wants to get greater glory out of my life. Hallelujah. It's not a sign that God has abandoned me or he's forsaken you, me Lord. or he's forgotten about Good. me. Good word. It's a sign that God desires to get greater glory out of my life yes. than he ever has before. Yes. And God is greatest glorified when you and I are brought to the end of ourselves. Yes. Yes. Because the end of ourselves is the beginning of God. Hallelujah. When we can't and only God can, God is the only one that can be glorified in that equation. Yeah. When I'm brought to a place that I have absolutely no hope of freeing myself, delivering myself, getting myself out of this mess, and only God can do it, there's no more opportunity for Ross to be glorified. There's only room for God to get the glory out of my life. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Think of Exodus chapter 14, whenever God delivers the people of Israel from Egypt. And he delivers them in great power and great might and great authority after all of these years of suffering and trial. And the first thing that happens when they get free is they come to this place where they're stuck between a Red Sea and an Egyptian army. If they go forward, they drown. If they go back, they're killed. They're in a hard place. But if you read Exodus 14 verses 1 through 4, what you will see is that they did not arrive at this place by happen chance or coincidence. God led them to the Red Sea. And God actually said, this is the providence of God. This is the wonderful counsel of God in heaven. His ways are above our yes. ways. His thoughts yes. are above our thoughts. God says, I'm going to allow you to go to that Red Sea. And I am going to cause the armies of Egypt to pursue you. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Now you're Come on. Didn't just happen. That's right. God allowed the enemy to pursue their life. 
But God says, I'm not allowing the enemy to come to destroy you. I'm going to allow this enemy to pursue you. And at the moment in time where you feel like all hope is lost and you can't see a way out, I'm going to come and deliver you. Now watch. And God says, and I'm going to get my glory out of your life. Yes. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to do this. I'm going to allow this so that I would be glorified yes. Yes. through your life. Yes. And so trouble presents us with the opportunity for God to be glorified yes. in us and through us. Yes. Everything that God does, everything that God does, He does with purpose. And strategic intent. Yes. Right. He does nothing haphazardly or unintentionally. It's not who God is. Yes. Everything that God does is full of purpose. It is full of value. It is full of strategic intent. And the purpose for which He does in us and through us what He does is first and foremost to draw us closer to Him, and secondly, to glorify His own name. Amen. This is why God allows the things into our lives that He does. He doesn't allow these things in our lives in hopes that they would destroy us or bring us to a place of despair. Now, Satan will play on that and he'll try to bring us to places of discouragement and despair. But God allows these things to prove us, to see if we will allow these things to push us closer to him than we've ever been before. Because in our pursuit of him, he is glorified. In our pursuit of God. He's glorified to the world around us. He promises to you and I. And I know these are very simple thoughts this morning, but I pray they would be a great encouragement to your heart. Yes, yes. That God promises to us that this purpose, this very intent purpose, will be accomplished in our lives as we walk with Him in faith. Yes. And perhaps no one knew this better than the Apostle Paul. A man who would write to us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 to tell us that I know that all things work together for the good. For them who love God and for them who are the called according to His purpose. Paul, through all of the trial, through all of the testing, through all of the tribulation, came to a place in his life where he was utterly and absolutely convinced that there is nothing that happens in my life that God does not cause or allow. And in his causing and in his allowing, his promise to me by experience is that he will work everything that I face for my good and for his glory. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Paul understood that because God is bent, he is intent on getting glory out of my life. He takes even that which is diametrically opposed to me. That which has every intention of discouraging and destroying me, God takes that and He uses it to further His kingdom and His testimony through my life. Yes. Have you read some of the things that Paul went through? Right. Some of the hardships, some of the circumstances that this man faced. If you're not really familiar with it, read 2 Corinthians chapters 11 and 12 when you get home. It'll take you about eight minutes to read those two chapters, but that's just a foretaste. Those two chapters are of what the Apostle Paul had to endure as a man of God. Beatings and persecution and opposition. You know, we get all in a hizzy when somebody talks about Come us. On, brother. Yeah. The Apostle Paul was beaten over and over again. <clears throat> he was stripped naked, thrown into yes. prisons. Beat to the point of death. Any moment he could have died. Actually at one point. He was beaten so badly. That he laid on the ground. And everybody was convinced that he was dead. Yes. 
And then God, by the power of His Spirit, rose Paul Hallelujah. up and Paul went right back into the city you, doing Lord. what he was doing before, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. You couldn't keep that man down. Yes. <laughs> because there was a power at work in his life. Yes. There was a convincing, a convinced heart within him Jesus. that knew that no matter what comes my way, if God's not done with me, I'm not dying. Yes. Right. Right. And if I do die, it just means that God's purpose has been accomplished in my life. And until I take my last breath, one way or another, whether through good or through bad circumstances, seemingly bad circumstances, God will get His glory out of my life. Yes. He will do it. No matter what comes my way. He was convinced of that. At the very end of Paul's life here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, He's beginning to recount to Timothy a particular event here in verses 16 through 18 that he personally experienced. And this was an event where he experienced God's presence in his deliverance. He experienced God's presence in the midst of his trouble and he experienced God's deliverance from this particular trouble. Now, I'm not going to get deep into these three verses. Commentators are kind of mixed as it concerns what Paul is really referring to here, in, especially in verse 16 when he's talking about this trial in 17 that God delivered him from, that God sustained him in. Some believe it was his first imprisonment. Uh, some believe it was his last as he stood before Nero, uh, just before Nero would you know, uh, execute judgment, uh, death against his life. But... I'm not going to get into that. Regardless of what particular event it was that Paul was referring to, I believe that there's great encouragement that can be had from these scriptures. Verse 16, Paul says, At my first answer, my first defense, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. He says, I pray to God that it might not be laid to their charge. As he faced this particular trial, there was no one who was willing to stand with or for him. Paul, in this particular instance, whatever instance it was, he was a man who had been wrongly accused. Great injustices were being carried out against his life. And there was no one who appeared to act as his advocate. No one to testify of his upright character or conduct. No one to uphold him in it. No one to provide him with strength, with encouragement, or comfort. Paul acknowledges this, but Paul is not bitter over it. So many times we become bitter, we become disheartened, we become angry because of the people who do not stand with us through our trials. They're not always called to. Come on. God may call people into your life to stand with you, to sustain you, to strengthen you. And thank God for those that He calls right. in those Amen. times. Amen. But there may be particular trials that you and I have to endure alone. That's right. 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 And I don't mean alone apart from the presence of God. I mean alone in the flesh. Yes. yes. That there really is no man or no woman right. that really right. understands what you're going right. through. Yes, they may have faced similar things in their lives, but deep within you, they don't understand the pain, the struggle, right. the confusion. Right. They can offer encouragement and thank God for that. But in Paul's instance, there was no one there to even offer him a simple word of encouragement. Now you think of it. This is Paul. This is the one who God has saved, radically changed his life, and he spends his whole life giving of himself for the sake of people. His whole life he spends it for the sake of people and for the sake of God's glory, and here he is at one of the most critical times in his life, and he's left alone. Paul would say things like to the church at Corinth that, guys, I love you so much that I'm willing to spend and be spent for you. I'm willing for my life to be a sacrifice, to be a drink offering poured out for your sake. And here Paul is standing alone. 
Paul acknowledges it, but he's not bitter over it. Because although there was no mortal man present, God was. Yes. Verse 17, Paul goes on to say, Notwithstanding, or nevertheless, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. It literally means that the Lord Jesus took his stand by the side of Paul. And he made himself responsible for all of Paul's needs. Which in this case was the need for grace and strength. This knowledge of God's presence, it strengthened Paul. No man was willing to stand in my defense. No man was willing to be with me, to help me, to strengthen me, to comfort me. But God was with me. Yes. His promise to me that he would never leave me or forsake me stood true in the greatest test of time. Amen. The most critical moment of my life when I could not find anybody in the flesh to be faithful, I found God to yes. be faithful. When all men failed me and forsook me, God stood with me. He did not leave me. He did not forsake me. His promises to me were true. He stood with me in it. And then Paul says, he delivered me from it. Yes. Can I tell you something this morning? That whether God is with you in the midst of your trial or whether God is in the process of delivering you from your trial, you are in good hands. Whether He's with you there or He's delivering you from there, know this, you are in the hand of God. Either way, God is in control. Be assured of this one thing, God has not lost command or control of your life. Thank you, Lord. you might have lost control and command of things that are going on in your life. You can't control this and you can't control that. But God has not lost control of your life. Yes. No matter how much it seems to be spiraling out of control, know this, it has not caught God by surprise. And even though it's overwhelming to you, it is not overwhelming to God. The Lord stood with me. I pray that you hear the heart of Paul. That he's really, he's testifying from his heart to Timothy. And I believe he's telling this to Timothy in hopes that his trust and confidence in God would spill over into the life of Timothy. The Lord stood with me. And he caused the testimony of Jesus to be perfected and portrayed through my life. Situations, circumstances, and powers attempted to hinder it, but they couldn't. I was preserved. I was kept. I was sustained by the power of God. Yes. And then he goes on in verse 18 to say, And I know that going forward the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Hallelujah. Now let's clarify this. This is not Paul saying that God will not allow or suffer bad things to happen to us. That's right. But rather that the enemy's plans and purposes yeah. in those bad things will not, cons will not succeed. Yeah. Psalms 91 tells us that he shall deliver us from the snare of the fowler. Yeah. In every trial and in every trouble, the enemy is attempting to lay traps and snares before you in an attempt to discourage you to quit on God. But God says, if you'll trust me and walk with me in faith, even though the enemy may place those snares before you, I'll deliver you from them every single time. Yeah. Troubles will come, but you, your faith will not be overcome. Right. Peter, I'm, a, I'm going to allow Satan to sift you as wheat, right. but I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. Yes. The enemy's scheming to destroy and to thwart the testimony of Jesus in my life will be unsuccessful. Yes. Paul said God saved me. God 
sustained me. God rescued me. God preserved me. And He did not just preserve me so that I could gloat and glory and say, oh, God preserved me, even though that's part of it. It's not just for me. God preserves me yes. so that His purpose, yes. which is to glorify the name of His own Son, yes. might be seen yes. in the world around me. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Go back to verse 17. Look what Paul said. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Watch this. And this is like Paul is saying, this is why. Yeah. God saved me. God preserved me. He stood with me so that the preaching or the message of the gospel might be fully known so that all of the Gentiles might hear. Yes, Lord. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Yes. Uh, God saved me. Right. He preserved me so that his purpose might be seen and revealed in my life. Yes. God saved me for the purpose of glorifying His Son. If you still have breath in your lungs this morning, understand the only reason that you are alive and in relationship with God is because God still desires to get glory out of your life. Don't take His salvations lightly. Don't take His deliverances of your life lightly. Don't take His rescues as a light thing. If He's rescued you time and time again from what should have overwhelmed you and overcome you, understand He's done it out of mercy and grace because He wants to use your life to glorify His own name. Don't take this grace that God has given you as a light or an insignificant thing. He's rescued you because He wants relationship with you, but He also wants to use you. No matter how insignificant you think that you are, He wants to use your life to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in this generation. In every generation, God has had a people who are saved to glorify Him. In every generation, God has had a people who were rescued to glorify Him. In every generation, God has delivered a people so that they might glorify His name in the earth. That's why God has spared you. That's why He saved you. It's to glorify the name of His own Son. You remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 12, Paul goes through this dissertation talking about these trials and these things that had come against his life. And I'm just going to turn there if you don't mind and read this to you very quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He's talking about his ministry, the ministry, the spiritual ministry that God has given him. And he's talking about the trials that abound in this type of spirit-filled, spirit-led ministry. Beginning in verse 8, we are troubled on every side, yet we're not distressed. We are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we've not been forsaken. We're cast down, but we are not destroyed. Yes, Lord. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. In essence, we're identifying with him through suffering. The dying of the Lord Jesus so that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus also might be manifest in our mortal flesh. Watch. So then death works in us, but life in you. What is Paul saying? Paul is simply saying that God's intended purpose is being accomplished in my life regardless of what comes my way. Yes. People are having the opportunity to see 
and to know Jesus through a life that is being kept and sustained by God. Hallelujah. Your life preaches more than you know. Right. I'm going to say that again. Your life preaches a weightier message than what you realize. Yes. The way that you live either gives great weight to the testimony of Jesus that you preach Amen. or it subtracts from it in a great That's right. way. That's right. That's right. But when you are sustained, when you are kept by the power of God, Paul said this is what the world sees, verses 8 through 12. He said this is what the world sees. They see a people who are pressed but not crushed, a people who are perplexed but not in despair, a people who obviously are persecuted, but they are not forsaken or abandoned. They've been thrown down time and time again, but yet their life is not destroyed. Yes, Lord. And while to us these trials and these troubles sometimes, they feel like death. Yes. Right. They feel like agony and it feels like, my God, when is this ever going to end? Yes. Right. And it feels, Paul says, we're delivered to death. And to us, it just feels like we're dying. But to that world out there, they see life. They see a people who are being kept by God's power. They see a people who have not given up. They've not thrown in the towel. Affliction and suffering and hell has come against their life. But yet they're continuing to serve God. They're continuing to praise God. They're continuing to walk with this God that they claim to serve. They're walking with Him in faith no matter what comes their way. Help us, Lord. And so I pray, my prayer is, Lord, stand with me. Yes. Lord, deliver me so that the world might see your ability yes. to save. Yes. So that the world might see your name glorified in my life. God is intent on getting His glory out of your life. Are you intent on allowing Him? Yes. Because if you'll allow Him, it will be painful. Yes. It will be troubles. It will be great trials. But no matter what comes against you, no matter how bad it hurts, no matter how many times you feel in your mind that you want to throw in the towel, if you will simply believe he will sustain you. Yeah. Right. And He will right. get His glory out yes. of you. Hallelujah. Life. Thank you, Lord. You understand? That's what Paul is saying here in verses 16 through 18. Yes. Hell itself, Paul is saying, tried right. to destroy me. Right. Some people believe that the lion referred to Nero. I do and I don't. I really believe it refers in a spiritual sense to the devil. Yes. That our devil, our adversary, not our devil, but the adversary, the devil, he roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I believe what Paul is saying at the last moments in his life. These are the last words that are penned by the Apostle Paul that we know of. And I believe in the last moments of his life, he's trying to let everybody know that Satan has tried to rob the right. testimony of Jesus from my life over and over and over again. But he's failed every time until now, and he will fail every time until I see Jesus face to face. Yes. That's what Paul is trying to say. And my God, may that be the testimony of my life. That at the end of my life, I'll be able to tell somebody, Satan tried so many times to rob me of the testimony and the grace and the life that I received in Jesus. He fought, he warred, he battered, he beat, he did everything that he knew to do. But some kind of way, God sustained me. And God delivered me every single time. Thank you, Lord. And I believe Paul, he admits so many times in his writings, look, I'm not a strong man, I'm a weak man. Right. I'm the chiefest of sinners. I believe in Paul's heart, he thinks about all of the times that he wanted to give up, he wanted to stop, right. he wanted to throw in the towel, but yet the grace of God would come and it would breathe fresh life into his heart and his soul. 
God's not going to allow you to give up easily. Yes. Right. You understand. Right. Amen. You're going to have to try really hard to give up on God. That's right. He won't just let you walk away and throw in the towel. He's going to deal with you. Amen. He's going to prod you. He's going to convict you. He's going to reach for you. He's going to give you every kind of exhorting and encouraging and convicting word that you can imagine yes. before you make that decision to leave. Him. Yes, Lord. Because Amen. He loves you. Yes. Amen. And because He is intent Amen. on getting His glory yes. out of Hallelujah. your life. Hallelujah. The psalmist would say in Psalms chapter 9, verses 13 and 14, he would pray, and I wish I had time to read the whole chapter, but I don't. It's a beautiful chapter, Psalms chapter 9. But he prays to the Lord and he says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. You that lift me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all of your praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. Surely I will rejoice. In your salvation. Yes. The psalmist is pleading for divine intervention. He's pleading for grace, but it's not just for reliefs or for deliverance's sake. He's pleading with God for this grace and this power so that God might be glorified through his life. Look at what he says. God, come and save me. Consider my trouble. Come and you've lifted me up before God. Come and save me again. And God, I want you to save me. And I want you to spare me. And I want you to deliver me, God, so that I can show forth your praise. Thank you, Lord. In the gates of the daughter of Zion. The word gates there, it, it speaks of the main entrance to a city. Or it could even refer to a city itself. But in essence, the psalmist is saying, save me so that I can spread your fame yes. all throughout the nation. The concentration of his prayer is the glory of God. Yes. Psalm 67, the, psalm, the psalmist says a really similar thing. He says, God, be gracious, be merciful to me so that your glory might yes. be revealed through my life. Thank and you. it just forces me to think, what grace would God bestow upon our lives if He and His glory was our goal? Yeah. If that was the goal of our lives, God, relationship with Him and His glory through my life, if that was my determined goal, God getting glory through my life, what kind of a grace would God extend oh, to me? Oh, hallelujah. God delights in rescuing His people. All right. What victories would be won? What enemies would be overcome? What battles would be won if that was our heart's yes. Yes. desire? Lord, thank you, Jesus. Psalms 22, and I won't read it for the sake of time, but Psalms chapter 22, verses 19 through 15, it's known as one of the Messianic Psalms, but... The psalmist is once again crying for salvation and he's crying for deliverance. And what you see is that the result of deliverance is a declaration of God and of his goodness. In essence, God was glorified when he rescued his people. I pray that your heart is stirred to cry to God this morning for deliverance. To cry to him for grace, to cry to him for help. And I'll read one more passage of Scripture. Psalms chapter 40. Pray that you're taking notes concerning these Psalms because I believe they'll be a great <clears throat> blessing to you. And if not, go back and listen to the message and, and just, just go back and look at these Psalms. They'll, just, they'll bless you so tremendously. I know they have me. Psalms chapter 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord and He inclined unto me and He heard my cry. Yes, Lord. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, yes. oh, thank you, Lord. an agonizing place, out of the miry clay, place of bondage. And he set my feet upon a rock, a sure place, a steady place. And he established or he empowered my goings. Watch this. This is the result. Verse three. And he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. 
Watch this. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. I'll say this and I'm done. God's salvation of your life will cause many to know and to trust in God. Yes. His rescue of your life. His deliverance of your life. Yes. It is not just for deliverance sake or just for salvation sake. God wants to help you, to strengthen you, to deliver you. So that he could use your life to glorify the name of of his own yes. Amen. The psalmist said in Psalms chapter 3, verses 6, 7, and 8, he talks about this time in his life where the enemy was taunting him and coming against him, bringing about confusion and doubt into his mind. And this enemy was coming against his life. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this attack from the enemy, the psalmist says, But you, O Lord, yes. are my glory. You're the lifter of my head. What the psalmist was saying is that, God, you have caused the taunting of my enemies to be ineffective in my life. Yes, they're screaming. Yes, they're taunting. Yes, they're railing out accusations. But, God, the faith that you've placed in my life has caused those tauntings to be ineffective. God, I still trust you. Yes. God, I still believe you. Thank you, Lord. God, I still love you. That is the evidence that God is still at work in that life. Amen. Amen. Amen.